John, you want to call, give yourself a call out there? Sure, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is John Borchert. I'm the Associate Director of the Network for the study of the Cultural Study of Video Gaming uh, here at UNCG. Um, and we're really excited to welcome you all to our um, inaugural event. And um, I can drop my email uh, and Greg's email in the chat on the side. So if you're interested in participating in more of these events or being a part of the network, um, let us know we're trying to grow and expand as well. So I'm happy to see so many people here. And again, thanks to Nick for, for, for kind of kicking off the whole event. And um, I'm Greg Grieve. I'm head of religious studies, and I'm also the director of the new network. And again, it is really with our great pleasure that we introduce Nick Bowman. Um, and Nick's research focuses on the uses and effects of interactive and immersive media with specific interests in social media, video games, and metaverse technologies. He's the uh, editor of the Journal of Media Psychology and associate editor of Technology, Mind, and Behavior. Um, he's recently completed a Fulbright in Taiwan, um, where he was researching the cognitive, emotional, physical, and social demands of virtual reality experiences, uh, including video gaming and digital advertising campaigns. Um, just so you all know, his gamer tag is Bowman Spartan, which I think goes well for us Spartans. I didn't know if you know that, Nick, but that's our... I did, yeah, I caught that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he would love to play. Um, he's, he also runs Moonshine at New Hanover for a moderate fee. Um, so again, <laughs> thank you so much. I really, we really, really do appreciate you coming in and um, and starting off what I think is going to prove to be a great research network. And I want to thank all of you um, for taking time to to be part of this also. Uh, and so, with no further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Nick. All right, thank you so much for having me. And um, I've got the chat window open as well. So if things kind of stream in, I'll, I'll note that. And earlier in the chat, I did share a link if you would like these slides. Um, a lot of times I include extra information and citations. And so you can pull all that information. And of course, if you can't find me, I'm at nick.bowman at ttu.edu. And, and I'll share that later as well. So I'm gonna do my best to rein in my gift of gap, but I'm also gonna go over a lot of information because I really want to dive in and lean into this idea of feeling and human flourishing. You know, we're talking about a, a medium that we, we generally accept as an entertainment juggernaut. We'll, we'll understand through media and communication research, through media psychology research that I come from, is that entertainment doesn't just mean fun. And recently, you know, over the last 10 to 15 years, We've seen a shift into understanding entertainment as a multidimensional construct that can mean fun and hedonic feelings, but also eudaimonic and deeper appreciative feelings. And I'm going to talk about that one today. And, and it's particularly fun to be in a group with many people from outside my discipline who can definitely engage some of these philosophical constructs. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. I'm going to use Arthur Morgan from Red Dead uh, Redemption as sort of my uh, guide through a lot of this presentation. And He's the one I'm running moonshine with when I'm not uh, here uh, in, in Zoom. So quick outline of my talk, let me get my uh, notes up and running here, is I'll talk, uh, one moment, we're uh, trying to get my slides to the minutes. Oh, I see. <laughs> so, Well, we will almost get my slides to advance. This is a technical glitch on my end of things. There we go. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about the evolution of gaming as a medium, as we understand it. I'll uh, talk about this interactivity of demand model and what that means for how we engage these digital spaces. I'll talk about eudaimonia and how we're moving there. And I'll talk about how this, what this might mean for human flourishing along the way. So when we think about the gaming medium, and, and by far the question I'm asked the most when I talk to parents, when I talk to the media, when I talk to graduate students is what do you mean games are serious? And that label serious games tends to mean games for education. You know, I grew up on Math Blaster and now I run statistical analyses and that's how we think of serious games. And those certainly exist, but the medium of course has changed over the 60 years we've had it. And the analogy I like to give and the story I like to give is film. So, you know, we notice that most of us on this call today would not challenge the idea that films are a serious form of storytelling, that we can tell gripping, emotional, 
disorienting dilemmas that, that help people reconcile the darker sides of life or the, or the, uh, the deeper sides of life, you know, through film media. In high school, I would watch film and literature classes. Of course, that was challenged at one time. You know, if you rewind back to the 1800s and you were to talk to the very first photographers experimenting with film and you would ask people, like, could this be a serious mode of storytelling? you would have been looked at quite strangely. And so if you look on the screen right now, you may recognize the galloping horse in the corner. It's largely considered, at least in the West, to be one of the first movies, moving pictures. These are the Moybridge films of horses running. The premise was to settle a bet. When a horse runs, do its feet leave the ground and how many? So the idea that Moybridge had was to set a bunch of cameras on a racetrack have a horse run past the cameras and then fire 16 consecutive shots and then take those images and flip them because we know the human eye has a persistence of vision. We, we see something right before us and then we see the thing in front of us and that allows us to essentially see motion. This was one of the first films. It's pretty neat to capture the living experience, the moving experience in a media form that allows us to see something that was captured 150 years ago. That's a neat technical demonstration. It's a neat concept for the growth of mass media and personal media, but if that was not a story. And it would take us a very long time to get from that initial technological demonstration to anything resembling storytelling, right? So we go from demonstrations to replications. You take a camera, and you stick it in the audience in front of a Broadway show or a vaudeville play, and the camera becomes the eyes of a person who's not there. It's only one camera, it's still on stage. We're just replicating the popular form of entertainment, but still pretty cool. And now I can see a play without going to it. I can shrink the distance between you know, different points and experiences. Now that's neat to get people to pay attention to a new medium, but it's still not innovative. And then you have Battleship with Empathy. You have this experience by which we, you know, take multiple angles of different screens, right? And take the cameras, cut up the film, and stitch it back together again. And at that situation, we have a completely new type of storytelling. This idea that I could build tension and turn by showing the parasol rolling down the stairs and the citizens running away from the army. And I can shift back and forth on these things. That was new. We didn't have that experience before. Uh, that allowed us to see different perspectives, different types of, of narrative techniques. If you followed film noir, you know, this was very much playing with the technology of narrative every bit as much as it was the narrative itself. And we got something unique, right? So we see that media follow these evolutions of demonstration to replication to extension of how we understand the human experience. If we were to go over to video games, we see something very similar, right? This started off as computer scientists wanting to test the technological limitations of their media. You know, to that point, computers computed. You gave them data, they gave you outputs. It was interactive in the sense that I hand A and I get the results back, but there wasn't a whole lot else going on in the process. And so these early engineers, at MIT and in the United States, developed a program called Space War that allowed two people to control spaceships rotating around a star well and calculate the necessary parameters to play that game. And that was a really neat demonstration of what a computer could potentially do, right? But that was it. It was fun for a couple of minutes and that's all you could do. Well, there's other ways of having fun with computers and, and video games, and we can tell the story of the hero's journey, right? So we can have Mario save the princess. And that's a pretty standard replication of a very basic story with a couple of jumps along the way. It's interesting, it's fun, it's engaging. And then we see games realizing that they can listen to you. And you can have a dialogue with the characters. You can have a dialogue with the narrative. You can make decisions that matter. If anybody's ever played the game on screen, Spec Ops The Line, it deals with the slow mental decline of a soldier deployed to the Middle East in a fictitious battle. And one of the things that happens early on in the game 
is you end up using a white phosphorus grenade on, on friendly troops. And you see the horrors of chemical warfare firsthand. And you and your colleagues realize what you've done. You, you've burned alive fellow citizens who were rescuing refugees from a war zone. And your character starts the slow decline and you're grappling with what does it mean to shoot people? Um, the developer Walt Williams talked about, let's not say games aren't violent, they are, but sometimes the violence is in context. And when the violence is in context, the player responsible for pulling the trigger has a very different relationship with that context. We're seeing similar things in virtual reality. Very briefly, we go from 1968, the ability to put pixels in an environment that you can see with glasses, the, the sort of Damocles, to taking something like you know, the Apollo 11 capsule and letting you sit in it and look around, to recent research we did at West Virginia where we went to flood zones and we told the stories of the people who survived these thousand year floods from their perspective and their homes as the waters were receding. Again, we're getting different ways of telling a narrative, in this case, telling a narrative in a sphere as opposed to telling a narrative in a rectangle. So I point this out because whenever we sit in a chair at a point in time, the media in front of us seem quite static. Books and film are good for telling stories. Games are good for challenging your brain. And we kind of leave it at that. Virtual reality, we're not sure what it is yet. And I want to challenge that narrative because we always look back on history and learn a whole lot moving forward. It shouldn't surprise us that games are starting to present us these deeper and darker sides of the human enterprise. Um, now, when we think about this movement towards the, the more serious, we also have to realize that there's another feature of, of media, of games, that we don't often consider front of mind, and it's how demanding they can be. And I think it's a challenge to how we are going to engage these experiences, right? So a common factor in all these evolutions is that as the media you know, become more rich, present more content, present more context. They also progressively embody the user. They start to more deeply engage the breadth and depth of our human senses and our experiences. And it's not just an invitation to interact. It's a requirement, right? I remember when I was a kid and playing Sonic the Hedgehog. And if you didn't play the game, if you just set your controller down, you know, Sonic would stand there he'd start tapping his foot and eventually he'd jump off the screen and you would actually lose a life. The character would, would, would essentially commit suicide because you're too slow. And of course, it fit the theme of the video game. But the point here is that you have to move forward. The film will go on without you. The game is not gonna go on without you. But we can think about what this has done to the relationship between the audience member and the, uh, between the content and the player. We even shift it from audience to user to imply a much more active process. You know, in narratives, we wonder what's going to happen next. Um, if anyone recognizes the image on screen, it, it, it's an artist rendition uh, from Never Ending Story, where the protagonist, Atreyu, has gone through all these trials and tribulations, and he's almost to the end, and he sees these two statues, and that if he's not courageous, the statues will know this and they will zap him with lasers. And he just got finished watching a knight in shining armor go through the statues and get lasered. And when I'm a little kid with my popcorn and my parents, and I'm so nervous because I can't do anything for Atreyu except hope he's going to be brave. And I remember not looking. I don't think I've ever actually seen the scene. I've heard it because I was too scared to watch. Now, of course, in the video game, we have a similar situation, except you get to make the call. Somewhat. We, we could have an entire lecture series on perceived agency in games, right? But if we take Link and the journeys through Hyrule and, you know, the very opening board of Zelda, you have more than one option here. You immediately have four. Up, left, right, or cave. Now, eight-year-old me is not going to go in the cave. Well, maybe I would have gone in the cave. 40-year-old me is not going in the cave. Turns out if you go in any direction without going in the cave, you're going to get attacked by a monster. And eventually you figure out if you go in the cave first, a very famous game and saying, it's dangerous to go alone, take this. You know, the, the old man doesn't actually accompany you on your journey because it's dangerous, but he does give you a weapon 
and it kicks off your, your battle through the rest of this game. Now, if you've played Zelda, this decision is pretty simple, but the point I'm making is even in a very basic gaming environment, you have multiple options. And we have advanced quite a bit since 1985 in terms of the options and the interactivity we give the player. Now, we can think about this demand on at least five dimensions. These come from my research, from my team's research, from various authors. And we're trying to parse out what it means to demand something of the player. I'll go over five briefly. Um, there might be more. These five have been pretty reliable. The most basic one is the cognitive demand. We absolutely expect a game to compel us to rationalize and understand its underlying system. If we define games as, you know, rules and sets with an end state, that there's a win state, our job is to solve that. It's the thing that we've expected since the very first game at MIT, solve the puzzle in front of you, right? Uh, we can get into cognitive science and look at some of the correlations between cognitive skills and, and solving puzzles. Uh, we've done research showing that people who are able to rationalize 2D images into 3D can play video games much better, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, this one's not surprising. We measure it lots of different ways, thinking really hard, mental gymnastics, drawing on your resources, the, the idea that the mental challenges affect how you play, the game stimulates your brain. And if you're interested in these, um, we, we have these scales uh, translated to English, German, and Mandarin. Um, and the neat thing about that is these ideas have replicated across language sets and cultures. So we're pretty confident we're on to something with these demands, right? This one's not too surprising. I won't spend a lot of time on it. Then we get to the emotional. We get to the idea that a game can compel you to have a more complex emotion, right? It can compel you to have a reaction similar to the reactions in the tapestry of emotions you would experience in daily life. When we talk about this one, we can think about things like the game tugging at your heartstrings, uh, uh, giving you the feels is actually an item that's translated. It's kind of fun to see that, that one work out. Being emotionally moved, having a bond, having unexpected feelings during gameplay. Now, when you read these, of course, they, they, they sort of ignore the basic. They ignore like mad, angry, sad. And it turns out in later research, when we talked with people, they wanted to make sure that we tapped those as well. I, I think this was a, a researcher bias. I'm into eudaimonia. I looked at higher order emotions from the argument that people were saying games can't elicit those things. Uh, to go back for a moment, we, we find in prior work that 98% of gamers or so can recall having like basic level emotions, but about 75% of gamers can recall having these high order emotions. And that's really surprised a lot of people when we talk about their complicated relationship with the media, okay? We can think about the physical, right? Um, the, the literal act of touching the system in some way. And this has been kind of a neat one because it breaks off into more than one subset. Um, there is both the more discrete action. So uh, being a game scholar, I have controllers all over my desk. <laughs> I mean, they're really all over the place here. And we can think about, you know, the discrete ability to operate this thing. Uh, we often think about this in terms of it being perceived as intuitive, right? And the funny thing about that, when we talk to gamers, this tends to be more intuitive than the VR controllers over there, which is a bit of a paradox, right? Because the, the VR systems are meant to actually map the human uh, system. And yet our mental models for the controllers are so strong we're good with those. It's kind of like the QWERTY keyboard, right? That's not the alphabet that we learned, but our fingers know it really well. We also have exertional demands, the holistic body. We are getting to a point with the technology that we can get your entire body in motion in some way, shape, or form. And that's starting to play a role in this interactive experience, right? You know, some of the ways you talk about this are in terms of, uh, you know, apparatus controller intuitiveness, in terms of being physically exhausted after gameplay. Right? This one is not totally surprising, but nonetheless, we're seeing these things pop up. You know, and someone mentioned that, you know, even in non-gaming applications, we see this. And that's an important point we're going to tap a little later. Um, the final one we're going to note is the social aspect. That, you know, we often talk about gaming 
at least when we talk about it colloquially, as a uh, an isolated activity. But but if you go through the history of games, you'll notice that you know the very first games were social by nature of the fact that we didn't have the processing capacity or knowledge of AI to create an opponent for you, right? Space War required two people to play. Um, the earliest games were found in taverns and bars, and of course we made arcades, and then we went online. Um, moreover, video games don't always occupy, are, are not always populated by humans. They're populated by avatars, and, and all these forces play a role in the experience of being aware of the presence of social actors. And we've seen this also influence the way that somebody responds to a game. Um, some of the ways we tap this are, are the role that socializing plays, uh, the, you know, how aware you are of the sort of agency of others, uh, being compelled to interact, feeling obligated, um, being around other people. And again, I wanna reiterate, others doesn't always mean human. Uh, I mean, a lot of the work, I think Jamie Banks is on the call as well, we look at the social relationships people have with uh, non-human avatars and things of that nature. Now, you know, I want to say that these demands aren't that interesting, right? I mean, th this is not deep. This is something that we could have sorted out just by thinking about the medium. And, you know, but the reason I point them out and the reason I think they're important for today's conversation is they serve as mediating variables between the game design and the outcome that we want. And one of the things that we often see is sort of maybe a false perception or assumption that we want all these to be high all the time. That everybody wants to think really hard and feel really hard and work really hard and socialize really hard. And I think what you're gonna see is these things start to fight each other, especially when you're going towards different gaming outcomes. So the reason we developed some of these measures, in a way, it was almost, you know, I work on old cars as a hobby, and sometimes the mundane tasks are important because the cool task can't happen without them. If I don't put an exhaust on the car, I can't drive it around the neighborhood when I work on the engine, right? Um, these mediators are going to play a critical role in how we think about the extent to which a game can be serious or not. And that's what I'm going to talk about now as we move towards eudaimonia. Or eudaimonia, I, I don't know if we agree on how it's pronounced, and I will bounce back and forth even during this conversation, right? So going back to the evolution of games, it wasn't always the case that games were considered to be toys and games are considered to be violence. Uh, Kali Karosek, a, a great cultural scholar of games, argued that really it was the game Death Race that caused this. Uh, so there's a movie called Death Race 2000 with David Carradine. It's a dystopian science fiction film. Um, as if there aren't, I don't know many that aren't dystopian. It's free on YouTube, incidentally. Uh, and it's a great David Carradine movie if you're interested in this stuff. Where, you know, we're in a corporate controlled America. And once a year, there's this race across the country. And you get points for completing the race first. But you also get points for murdering folks along the way. Uh, for example, the infirm because they're too expensive for society to care for, right? But there's one scene in the movie where the nurses at the hospitals come out and they roll their patients onto the highway and they sit on an overpass and watch the racers drive by and they giggle with glee as, as the racers take out the patients because you're saving society money. I'm getting at this because while the movie had that context, the video game, which was an unauthorized shout out to the movie, had none of that context. If you look in the top left corner, it was just a race car and gremlins, humans. And if you hit them, they screamed and turned into crosses. And you played this game with a steering wheel and a gas pedal. And maybe someone's played it before. Um, it's pretty wild. And, and Charlie is right. The original movie is way better than the sequel. Um, this game, which wasn't very popular, it was by a relatively unknown publisher it's a seduction of the innocent thing all over again. You know, the, the small underground stuff gets the attention, but boy, it got the attention of many people at the time. It was the murder simulator because you're doing something with your steering wheel that you do when you go home. And we were terrified about this. And it sort of started this link between violent games and violent outcomes. And of course, the technologies for telling these stories got way better over the years. You might recognize Kano from Mortal Kombat, where it was a 
motion capture, full motion video, high resolution scanned video game, fighting game, where at one point among the many fatalities you can perform, the main one of the characters can punch into your chest cavity, pull out your beating heart, take a bite out of it, hold it in the air and blood squirts from the severed arteries. Again, parents aren't happy with this. Nobody's happy with this. Uh, I was happy when Mortal Monday happened, but nobody else was. And of course, we got the ESRB shortly thereafter. And if you go even further into motion capture games, and, and the game in the, in the bottom corner there was a game called Manhunt, which is basically a virtual reality simulator uh, uh, um, gore fest, where you were a prisoner getting out of prison, and you were performing for the camera. You were given all sorts of different weapons, and, and you were essentially trying to entertain an overlooker. Now you could imagine the Nintendo Wii version of this game where you've got your nunchucks in your hand and you can actually do the motions. One of the first weapons you get in this game is a plastic bag that you put over somebody's head and you dare at them with your controller to, to kill them. So games evolved in these violent portrayals. And we can't, question, we can't question that. You know, as a game scholar, I'm always a bit reluctant when game scholars will say, we shouldn't look at violence at all because that's not fair. However, what is fair there's a lot more going on here. First, in a lot of these, we see research suggesting that sometimes the violence takes a back seat to the skill uh, perception. It, it's a reappraisal. So for example, a fatality was a situation in which uh, you had to know a certain set of combinations and a certain set of moves at a certain time at a certain point pre-internet. So you really had to learn it on the playground, right? It was almost like a source of social capital to where the, the fatality was a, was a MacGuffin. It was, a, it was less important than the fact that you were the one to pull it off. But more importantly, we evolved in a different way. So we started seeing games shift from below the neck verbs, punching, kicking, shooting, running, to above the neck verbs. I mean, if you look at the images on screen, what is the point of motion capturing someone's facial muscles if all you're trying to do is cut their head off? And the answer from interpersonal communication, right, would be, Nonverbal communication, emotional appraisals, showing the humanity of your avatars. You know, if you look at modern game budgets and modern game design, we're seeing a shift towards this intense level of interpersonal cueing, uh, of making sure that, you know, not for every game, of course, but there are sets of games where it is everybody is important to capture the pores on somebody's face as it is the blood coming out of their arms, right? Um, this above the neck shift is a relatively new one in the industry. Um, it's proven profitable. More importantly, I think it's proven to be critically successful. And we're going to see more of this moving forward. Okay. A couple of back notes on this to get us towards eudaimonia. You know, we know that players have meaningful social relationships. Uh, myself and Jamie Banks have talked about how players will talk about their avatars in ways that's not always identification. Sometimes they see their avatar as having its own journey and they have a job of negotiating that character through the journey, almost in a caretaker role or as a friend role. And that's gonna change how you interpret what's going on screen, right? We know from research that players don't just turn off their morals in games. So some of my earliest work was looking at people's moral sensitivities for uh, at the trait level, you know, your reactions to violations of harm and care. Uh, and, and loyalty and authority and purity. And it turns out that people with really sensitive reactions to harm and care violations in the sort of meat space have those same reactions in a video game, so long as the game was programmed in a way that didn't reward one or the other. So we just used a game where you were playing an RPG, but you didn't have an immediate uh, reward for doing it one way or the other way, right? Grand Theft Auto is not the best example because Grand Theft Auto doesn't really reward you for being nice. But there are plenty of RPGs that do, you know, that have morality systems and things like that. And we found that, yeah, uh, we could predict with some reliability, people who don't like to behave unfairly wouldn't do it in the game either. And, and it poked a couple of holes in the idea behind the magic circle that when we go digital, all bets are off, all rules are off. Well, we know from media psychology that magic circles don't necessarily absolve of his our humanity. 
And sometimes that humanity is triggered in the environment. In fact, in later research, we found that you could write the game in a way that might trigger moral sensitivities that you otherwise don't have. And if you trigger those sensitivities, people would more often than not avoid being bad, so to speak, right? Yeah, someone said we leak through the keyboard eventually, and that's a really good way to put it. Um, we know that engaging violent acts in games can elicit guilt and contemplation. I was talking right before we got on the, uh, the, the talk today with our colleagues here. Our team has a paper coming out very soon in New Media and Society that the very famous uh, Call of Duty No Russian level, where the player uh, infiltrates a Russian terrorist cell undercover. There's a level where you come out of an elevator to sack an airport and your colleagues just start shooting civilians wantonly. And there's blood everywhere and nobody is armed. Nobody's an enemy combatant. What you're seeing on screen right now is, is a capture of somebody's reaction video to seeing this level. It's gruesome, it's gory, it's gross, it's repugnant. And that was the point. We looked at about 600 or 700 uh, um, Reddit discussions of this level. And we found that about 25% of them were people that were actively challenging their own decision, right? If you're a Call of Duty player, you've been shooting things for a very long time. So it's interesting that this level caused you to question that when all the other deaths didn't cause that question. And this was actually a pretty coarse and blunt uh, example of doing something bad. And my colleagues on screen, these other publications over and over again, were finding trace evidence for this idea that people can feel guilty after playing a video game, especially when the violence is put in context. That says a lot for how we think about murder simulators, right? When you watch Schindler's List, you're not supposed to emulate the action. You're supposed to learn from the action. And we're seeing that in games as well, right? Um, already said this, but we see games going for emotions beyond aggression. Um, one of the ones we're seeing lately is this idea of social nostalgia, that uh, people are recalling their childhood. And when they recall their childhood, it's not the game they remember, it's who they played with. Um, it's becoming an important anchor for uh, family communication. Uh, this is a quote from a participant in a study where they said, you know, my father passed away. And so Mario Kart's how I remember him. Like that was my memory is dad and I sitting in the living room playing Mario Kart. Remember the average gamer is in their late 30s, early 40s. So, so they're, of, they're, they're having children and this medium is growing up along with them, right? So if we move into eudaimonia, the setup for all of that is if we can move past the idea that games are only for enjoyment or only for aggression, we can move into what is eudaimonia. And I'll, I'll wrap with, the, with these slides and open it for questions here. First, we have to think about this construct is a bit of a vague one. And, and if you ask 20 philosophers, I think you'll get 20 answers. But we can think about the idea of it being more than just a pleasure. That will suffice for now. And I'll unpack what that's meant in our research at this point. So, you know, this idea that you can have an experience through gaming. We looked at 80 plus studies that claim to use eudaimonia in games in some way, shape or form in a scoping review. We found three things. We found one, when players talked about this, they talked about it as a media effect. It was, I played this game and the result of my playing this game is I felt moved afterwards much in the same way that we hear folks discuss critical form. Sometimes it was the narrative. Sometimes it was the technical accomplishments. So if you're seeing the screen right now, this is Aunt May ill in bed and, and Spider-Man, you know, talking over her. This is from Spider-Man 4 for the PlayStation 4. Some players were moved by the story. Some were moved by the technical accomplishments. Like it looks so real. They look so sad. I really felt like I was there. So the imprecise part is that we're not sure what's triggering it. There's some narrative elements, but there's also some technological elements. But we are seeing a recognition from gamers that these things can make you feel these deeper ways. We're seeing a constellation of the meaning we attach. So some players would talk about it be having an idiosyncratic meaning, that they would see that experience 
it would mean something to them and them alone, different from their friends. And that was wrapped up in the play. Sometimes they were moved by a very specific element in the game, kind of like a scene in a movie. And they would remember that twist or that decision or that gut wrench. And it would stay with them for the rest of the game and beyond. And for some players, they would talk about this in almost in terms of identity management. I did some things, and now I'm thinking about how I would do that in reality, or what does that say about me, or how do I take what I now know about myself and work that into other environments. And what I want to point out is these aren't always games that are written with overt moral messages in mind. Some of these experiences, believe it or not, were with games like Halo. And where that would pop up is this last one that seems to be particularly powerful with video games was this social connectedness. Going back to my dad and I playing Mario Kart. And that's a situation where the content of Mario Kart meant almost nothing. But it was the constellation of a daughter and a father sharing an experience and having this meaning that only they had with each other. It's the, uh, the Halo group that plays on Fridays. It's the, you may have read about World of Warcraft funerals and a player will pass away or, or weddings in the same space, right? So we're seeing both the game content triggering these things, but also some of the gaming experiences more broadly, right? If we had to go through where this matters for human flourishing, first, Games might be as much about the pleasures of cognition as the pleasures of control. And I almost don't like the word cognition there because it implies only the cognitive demands. But it might be as bit as much about sorting through the experience you just had as it was pushing the buttons and winning the game. And that's something that I think to a lot of us probably on here right now, we take this for granted, but I don't think it is a wider spread cultural narrative, especially in Western culture that it's okay to play. The, game, the games are, are, are a valid space to explore eudaimonic feelings and issues. We still see vestiges of moral panic that I think hurt us. Uh, this was an article that came out in Undark Magazine, and I was, I was quoted, my research was quoted in the article, and in the comments section right away, I think someone wrote, you know, people who play emotionally engaging video games are in need of a good mental health therapist. And I found that interesting comment because replace video game with book or movie, and we would never say, I can't believe you're reading deep books, right? Emotional engagement is a stated design of these experiences, and, but we're still seeing it displaced or removed and even muted in some cases. Discomfort is much easier to accomplish in a situation where you have to touch things and move things around, right? And so on your own time, you can share these notes and play the Adventures of Anxiety game where you literally meet your anxiety devil and have to negotiate your life with your anxiety monster on your shoulder. Um, the game Facade has you watching a marriage fall apart and your job is to fix it. Or maybe not, you don't actually know. Someone asked, why can't it be both? And, you know, a, a journey of the body and the mind, I think it can be what's going to make game-based discomfort and disorientation powerful is that it works on, I think, both dimensions. The issue, of course, is that we're not sure how to reconcile all the demands. For example, a lot of us expect our games to result in flow, a careful balancing of challenge and skill. However, flow is not always what you want if you want somebody to be discomforted. What about a game like, you know, my cotton pick in life, where you're trying to teach people about the, the horrors of the Uzbeki, you know, cotton picking children slaves, where the game forces you to pick cotton all day, and you can never win. No matter how much you pick, you never meet your quota, and the monotony is the point, where you leave the experience because it's too tedious. And then, of course, you're reminded you can log off whenever you want to, but what about the people who work in these fields? The rhetoric of the game is to teach you exactly what is happening there in a way that maybe a, a, a written narrative couldn't because you don't quite simulate what's going on. Death and loss are popular themes in games. 
And maybe as we get towards the very end here, we have to remember we don't, it's not like we enter digital spaces and leave everything there. No more than we suspend ourselves when we enter that space. When we leave that space, we don't leave our digital self behind, right? We don't unplug from either space. In fact, um, our team's been writing with some, with some scholars of violence prevention to see if we could actually use video game violence as a lesson for preventing violence in the future. And we're starting to engage discussions like this. So all of this is meant to say the games are popular and they arrest our attention and they demand a lot from us. And this works in our favor. However, until we really dive into what those demands are and do they complement each other, and then of course get past sort of the cultural narrative that games are for play, it's really gonna stunt what we can take from these things. So I'm gonna leave it there because I wanna have time for questions. And um, I really appreciate your time today. And I'll end my screen sharing. Thank you so much, Nick, that was great. Um, so we have time for questions. You can either type them in the chat and John will get them. Or if you wanna raise your hands, I see lots of raised hands. Um, why don't we go back and forth? Um, John, you wanna start with a chat question first? You're muted, sir. Got it, got it, got it, sorry, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, I have a question here from Charlie. I don't know if Charlie wants to, to speak it out loud. I can, I can read it either way. Fine, either way. I don't mind. Okay. Go ahead, Charlie. Yeah. Well, I was just curious about the, the the average arc from anathema to acceptance of any new media, because you know anything comes out, there's always going to be a group of people that are more or less older or in charge or in control of what's going on. This is bad. It, dare, I, I hate to use the term sinful, but and mainly it's because simply we don't understand it. And there's sure. going to be a res natural resistance. And then over time, there's it goes back and forth like the pendulum on a clock or a pendulum that slowly gets to the point where it's not necessarily a non-issue, but it you see things getting so out of control and then we don't realize what they're doing to us. And then that gets reined in. All the bad stuff starts to level itself out, the back problems from sitting too long and so forth and so on. Sure, sure. You so know, and the, yeah. right. I love the question because it comes up all the time and I see two camps. So the quick answer is, I don't think we know. One argument is that as the rate of technological adoption increases, the rate of moral panic increases, but it also increases the where it blips and rolls and it blips and rolls. So one answer is we see more moral panics, but we see them dissipate more quickly. Um, I've been surprised that I haven't seen as many moral panics around VR, for example. And if you read Jacob, however, if you go back and look at some of Jacob Cohen's work on um, folk doubles and moral panics, he talks a lot about the role of the uh, news cycle in moral panics. And some of those panics endure to where the technology might change, but the panic remains. So it's a tough question to answer because on the one hand, they blip faster, but on the other hand, so many of the panics are rehashings. You know, it's the same panic from the last technology applied to the next technology, applied to the next technology, applied to the next. I wish I had a better answer. Um, but if anything, we see it happening quicker. Um, but it also means we leave room for the next one, right? So, you know, just when we get to the next blip. Now, that being said, um, you're probably right as gamers get older. And I don't mean that younger people don't play, but I mean people who grew up with it never stopped playing. That has a major influence because they're now the creators and the writers and the parents and the policymakers, right? So now it's just the thing they had when they were younger as well. I hate to throw so much of it to age, but the combination of that and um, I think the, that and learning the storytelling techniques, many of us may have played moral choice games earlier and they were just so blunt and tacky they weren't even fun and now we're starting to see just better storytelling and a better experience so um it's a great question it's one that i want to investigate more um they will never go away that's for sure let me um i'm gonna ask uh, lisa you had your hand up i think is that correct i was just applauding but i can ask the question too okay I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, but if, if somebody else um, is in line, that would be fine. 
There's no line, so go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. No, thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it, especially the, the violence aspect, since I'm um, in my research also interested in um, shooter games and all the discussion um, related to that and the discourses. And I was wondering, when you are working with uh, violent prevention, um, I don't, I don't know. Maybe you can you can elaborate a little bit. Oh, um, sure, on What sure. you are doing in that direction? And um, I, I think, it, do you have some specific examples? Because um, some um, some case studies from uh, Israel Palestinian conflict came to my mind. Um, I read in the past, and I found yeah. it really interesting in how to how these simulations and this um, engagement with the the other side or or a different perspective on the conflict can um, yeah change your mind at least to some extent. And I would be really interested in sure. what you're working in. This is the newest stuff, like where we're still in the conceptual stages. The, the basic idea was made on two observations. The first one was the idea of emotional reappraisals, that we can do something, and it might mean, it might look like something on screen, but to the, to the uh, uh, perpetrator, it meant something very different. So the example would be the headshot in a video, in a first person shooter. To the casual observer, what a monster you are. To the gamer, it's, this is how good I am at this. To where it's almost decontextualized. And that sounds horrifying. How can you de decontextualize, you know, shooting? Now, I boxed in high school. So that was an example of decontextualizing. I didn't know the person I was punching. They didn't know me. Um, and it made it weird. And then eventually easier because they would hit you and then you would hit them back. And, but then you would leave and like, they won. That's why I'm here. And um, we go hang on afterwards. So part of it was the reappraisal notion and trying to figure out, and I don't think we have a great handle on when and how and why do gamers reappraise. And I think sometimes we, we put it in clinical terms, we call it, you know, uh, 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 moral discounting, but that assumes it was moral to begin with. And that's a debate we can have. Not all players saw it as a moral choice, given the context of the environment. And that's the second part of it is what is the context around the container? So the example of No Russian or the example of Spec Ops The Line, the context was such that the players knew they were doing something wrong, right? Our thinking around this, and we've seen it a little bit in some work on interpersonal dating violence, where people are put in a scenario where there is a violent conflict or an aggressive conflict, with a container around it that gives them cues that it's wrong. And our hope is that those cues can help reappraise the experience in ways that might get you to reflect on it down the road, if that makes any sense. So whether it's it happens digitally and then you see it in your real life. So that's one area we've been trying to work on a grant for. Could kids, and it's gonna sound a bit controversial, see interpersonal dating violence in a video game? And then how would they respond to they saw it in real life? There's some research teams in the US working on that right now. Um, that's one idea. Um, the other one has been combining this with class lessons. So Mouse and Schindler's List and content like this is often used in education in this disorienting dilemma framework where you make someone uncomfortable, you challenge their schema of the world, but then you have some, uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? some extra lesson, some person to talk to, somebody to break it down and help them make the connections. Like, see, you know what this was. See, you know what that was. In many ways, it's not that different. I think Charlie put it in the chat than how we use films. It really just deals more with the fact that for so many folks, they're not ready to buy the idea that a game could be taken seriously. So it's not an overly clever approach, but we think that the medium allows it to be more impactful. But again, the context is really what matters. So that's where we're at now. And I'm happy to share the paper with you. It has a lot of proposals for research, but none of them have been done yet. It was really more of a position paper. Is there anyone else oh. out there who would like to ask a question either in chat or if you raise your hand? Uh, hey, Sophia, I see you raised your hand. Hello. Uh, for one, I just want to say I really, really, really loved uh, 
your talk. It was also very surreal to see facade in the presentation, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> uh, but regarding, in your research, you said that you found that people, at least commonly, don't like disregard their morals when they play mm -hmm. video games. I was wondering what you thought of people people playing non-violent video games in a violent way. Like, I guess, like, the best example would be, like, yeah. downloading violent mods for, like, The Sims or something. So I was just one curious what you thought of that. Yeah, so it's, it's funny, right? Because in some ways, on its surface, it is, like, the immediate counterpoint. People play The Sims and trap their Sim in the bathroom and take all the doors away. How can you tell me people are cool on games, right? And, of course, some of it is just the sandbox effect. It is the, can I play with this system? Uh, we've done some research on griefers. For folks who aren't familiar with that term, these are folks who go online and their only job is to make your life miserable. I play Red Dead Online. And about once a week, some jerk goes into Valentine, gets up on top of the tower, and shoots people as they come into town to buy supplies. And you just have to log out because you can't do anything about it. Um, what we find for griefers, for example, their path to enjoyment is really interesting because it's not a prey to them. That's the game. The game within the game is I know this game so well that I can build this experience, whether it's modding the code, whether it's, you know, just literally putting themselves in a position to ruin my game. It sounds like we're giving them an excuse. And admittedly, I think we need to go further with this population. But what we find more often than not, it's a reappraisal of the experience to where competence and autonomy become their modus operandi. That's why they're in the game. I want to learn every pixel, every move, every rule. And then I want to push it and push it and push it and push it. Whereas with many other games, it's gamers. It's more of a balance of autonomy and competence and relatedness. So the griefers essentially trade that one out. Um, I don't know if I go so far as to say that there's something psychologically different. Um, and it kind of reminds me of the early research in multi-user dungeons, uh, the Mr. Bungle case, the rape in cyberspace, the, this incredible debate over this person was sexually assaulting people in a chat room. But when you ask them, they were just griefing, man. It is something that's been happening for, for decades. I think we don't have enough deep data on it, except to explain that one part that it does seem like they enter the experience with a very different role in mind. And my guess is those aren't the players that are gonna take away the type of eudaimonic transformative experiences that I'm looking for. But Sophie, it's a great question because we all share the space together, right? There are flavors of experiences that we tend to forget are going to be intermixed in these environments. So my morning cup of coffee and relaxation is there shooting me and frustrating my day. Does that answer the question a little bit? It does, yes. Thank you. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Nick, it's, it's interesting. Bartle argues that griefers, be, they evolve into leaders. Yeah, yeah, I've seen this before. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, griefers so become he, leaders. Yeah, they really interesting. Yeah, so, they yeah. become the elite. Absolutely. It's and that's the point, right? They know it so well that they are on the show. And then, right. of course, griefing begats griefing. We see that happening. Yeah, they take on. They usually take on a caregiver aspect after a while, which I think is kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, but I'm not going to talk. Any any questions in um in the <laughs> chat, or anyone have anything else? I wanted to ask one question, which is kind of about the magic circle. And again, I don't sure. even know if I really have a question here. I just would be curious. So I was playing a lot of GTA. I mean, a lot of GTA. And I found when I was driving in real life, I wanted to drive like GTA. I did not do it. But it was really like I wanted, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to go between the cars. I wanted uh -huh. to break every traffic law. I never did it, though, but I felt my body wanting to have that experience, which I thought was kind of, you know, and again, I, I never actually broke any traffic laws, but I, uh -huh. I realized, I felt that- We actually had some wild data on this with yeah. traffic. Um, we did a study back at West Virginia and we were looking at people, it's actually the opposite. And it was the correlation between how they get to campus and how they play the game. And we created a fake level 
to where they had equal access to a car as they did to a bike. GTA is a very fun game to modify. On a different talk, I'll talk about our pornography modifications and how that affected violence and sex in the game and a very weird interaction effect. But with the traveling mods, people who walked to campus would walk to their destination in the game. And people who drove to campus were more likely to drive to their destination in the game. That wasn't like a 100% effect, but it was this weird thing where in a way it was the opposite effect, like how they sort of constructed transportation seemed to have some influence on how they um, engage the product. But the one you're talking about, some people talk about it in terms of this residual game effect where we will take like vestiges of the, the lesson or the logics that we just learned and at least temporarily apply them into our daily spaces. Uh, anybody here who plays Wordle, you might find yourself thinking about Wordle games a couple hours later and then like, you know, that runs through your mind. Um, and some of that's mental modeling, right? You are, think about neuroplasticity. We are at some level rerouting some of our connections to, to make sense of abstract concepts that are concrete in a digital space in a way that isn't always so separate from our physical space. And that membrane becomes interesting. And it's one that it's not invisible, but it's not super thick either, right? We, we exchange things back and forth. If we didn't, these games wouldn't be very engaging. Um, Faith has a question in the chat that I'll read out uh, for the room. Uh, she asks, a lot of, of what you've discussed refers to more story-driven games. Do you feel that multiplayer online games without in-game storylines like Rainbow Siege 6 or Fortnite still have significant emotional demands since they rely mostly on skill and player interaction? Thanks, That's a great uh, question. Faith. Yeah, Faith, thank you for that. And my quick answer is it wouldn't be as high with an asterisk. So one thing I'll note when we think about these demands, you know, when we think about them as variables, you know, from a psychological perspective, they're going to range from, from not at all to extremely high, right? And in fact, what makes them powerful isn't that they all exist or all don't exist, but different games probably have different demand signatures, and those demand signatures are probably what make the game experience very different. Like I'm thinking Elisa's uh, work with esports and in Faith, your discussion of games that are common to esports. My guess there is that you're going to see the physical and the cognitive demands be really high for that experience. And in fact, you don't want really strong emotional demands. If you're emotionally attached to the narrative when you're trying to defeat a team in an esport competition, it's going to distract you from the experience, right? So on one answer, it's probably much lower and probably intentionally slow. Uh, so the flip side, if anybody here has played Detroit Become Human or those types of interactive digital narratives, the cognitive demands are typically very low. You can't really lose that game, right? They want you to focus on the emotions. They want you to really feel through your answers. And that time pressure is even better. And they do that by removing a lot of the other challenges. In fact, I can't think of the game that does all five. I don't think it'd be a very good game. It, it, it would cause us to pop if we had to do everything at once, right? Um, however, the asterisks, the emotions might be attached to the social dynamics of the players. You know, it's the team spirit. It's the social bonding. These demands are conceptualized as unique, but they are correlated. So I suspect that you would see some residual emotion that comes from the social interaction, as well as some of the physical demands of the game. Um, but it's a great question you asked because it reminds us that those different demand signatures are what's going to help us understand that outcome. If you wanted somebody to feel a deep emotional lesson from a war game, you would not want to give them, you know, Fortnite. It would be a terrible idea. Um, that's a good testable hypothesis, by the way. Um, but that's ex I like where you're going with this. Um, people do sometimes construe their own emotions and they tell their own stories. So you could get something there. But certainly the game was unlikely to be designed to put any emotional labor on you. And that's probably on purpose. So you can focus on other things. We have a limited capacity to process information. And so we have to throttle some demands at the expense of others. We're, we're coming up on an hour. Um, is there anyone who really needs a, is just dying to ask a question?
Okay, again, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank Nick. That was a really great talk. Um, cool. Uh, he's, the slides are there in the chat if you want to download them. And um, Nick can be found online. <laughs> well, we're going to go play Red Dead now. And, um, uh, but also if you don't free shoot me, I see my horse going by. His name is Yorkie and he's my best friend and quit shooting a horse. <laughs> Um, yeah, so feel free to email him. And again, um, come to Lisa's talk on, is it, I always get, I'm getting a day on March 14th, March 17th. No, 17th. 17th. <laughs> so she doesn't have to be up at midnight. Um, and it's going to be on eSports and it's going to be super. Um, so feel free to come to that and we'll, we'll send out a reminder. John, anything you want to add? No, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming and, and for the, the questions, the participation, and thanks to Nick. This is our first kind of uh, public formal event as the network, and so we're really pleased to, to see everybody here. Cool. Keep us in touch. This is um, These communities are really important to grow, especially as we start wrestling with an increasingly complex medium that I think the scholarship's lagging behind a little bit in terms of capturing the complexity. So conversations like this help. And for the graduate students on the call, what I'll say is whenever we don't have answers, that's, that's gold for you. That's theses and dissertations and first jobs, right? So, you know, there's a lot of room to grow in this space and I'm happy to be a small part of it. And I've just put um, our email address and the website for the network in the chat there. So uh, drop us a line, uh, stay in touch. Uh, and and like, uh, like Nick said, it's important to kind of grow these communities. So 